Good morning and good day, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural Tiny ML Training Code around Asia. I'm Ri Dan Su. I am an assistant professor in Shanghai Advanced Research Institute, Chinese Academy of Sciences. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to Tiny ML Asia. It's my pleasure to introduce Yan Yan Boon, co-founder and CTO of H Impulse. His presentation today is teaching old sensors new tricks. Yan Yan Boon is an embedded engineer and machine learning advo advocate, always looking for ways to gather more intelligence from the real world. He has been working on tiny machine learning since 2017 first as a principal engineer at ARM and currently as the CTO in H Impulse. So welcome, Jan. Xie Xie Rudan, hi. Yeah, as, as Rudan said earlier, I, yeah, on one hand, I'm really grateful that we can be here today and actually share the session um, with all of you, like in this case, from the comfort of my own. It's 2 a.m. for me currently in Amsterdam. <laughs> um, but yeah, also very sad that we can't actually do this in Shanghai. I've had some amazing conferences, some amazing visits there. Um, Bar Rouge, if you've never been to Shanghai, go there, fantastic place. <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely go around. Um, and yes, as said, like the presentation here, first one of, of the day of Tiny Mail Asia this year is it's teaching our old sensors new tricks and kind of showing the underlying algorithms and the underlying principles that all of a sudden enable machine learning on these really small and tiny devices. So for me, I think this, so this is a photo of me um, back in 2017 while I was still at ARM. And for me, this was a pivotal moment um, because for the first time I kind of saw the potential that combining embedded software and combining kind of internet of things devices with machine learning um, could have and what kind of impact on society that could have. So every year, ARM was sponsoring. So I've been here three years in a row. And unfortunately, this year we had um, COVID as well. So it was canceled. Um, so every year, um, I was going to East Africa to assist in a summer school for data science and mathematics, master and PhD students. And for them, very often, the way that they dealt with sensor data, which is probably one of the most interesting parts of uh, one of the most interesting data sets that you can have because it allows you to interact with the real world rather than just with numbers that only exist in your computer. Um, so I went there to actually help them set up some data collection tools. So find ways of actually collecting data from the real world rather than having these people just open up a notebook and running a, and running a model against a data set that was already very well understood. Um, and I didn't realize what the impact could be of, of building systems that way. So the first couple of days of, the, of this conference, we were just sitting in a classroom talking about IoT and talking about building these systems. But on the last day, the very last day of the conference, it was kind of a sort of intermezzo at, uh, at the end, a couple of hours, we went to a dairy farm. Um, and we spoke to the farmer there. And together with um, a couple of lecturers from the university, we kind of devised a way in, in how can we help these farmers. And we hacked together, sitting in a field in, uh, this was in, uh, in Arusha, Tanzania, hacked together an embedded device that could collect data from a cow while it was walking about. Um, and so the, the University of Dekut in Kenya um, went on and, and kind of transformed that system into a system that could detect when cows are getting sick because their behavioral patterns change, um, or when cows are in heat. And that's because sperm samples are really, really expensive over there. So, for me, that was, that was beautiful. All of a sudden we have devices that we can now attach to cows. We attach some machine learning to it. And all of a sudden we now have a valuable proposition, a very local proposition, something that's really valuable somewhere in East Africa where they can actually save farmers money and keep their, keep their livestock healthy, which I think is super cool. So naturally that was not the first time that I ever heard about machine learning. I just never thought of applying this to IoT or the embedded space. Um, for me, this was the pivotal moment in machine learning. It was I'm not too sure how, how unknown this sample is, at least in China, but in 1996, um, Gary Kasparov, at that point, the, the best chess player in the world was beaten by Deep Blue. And that was the first time that 
kind of the best chess player in the world was beaten by a computer at this game. And it was for me truly, I mean, I was eight years old at the time, eight, nine years old at the time. And I liked to play chess. And kind of the, the idea behind, the idea prior to Deep Blue winning against Kasparov was really that computers were not a match for chess. And there was too many combinations to actually calculate this all through. And all of a sudden, kind of, it felt for us kind of out of, out of the blue, Deep Blue actually beats Kasparov and, and showing that chess was actually conquered by a computer. Um, and probably much more famous, um, AlphaGo a couple of years back, 2016, um, actually beating uh, here Lee Zedong, I think, um, one of the best Go players in the world at the time, which also was thought for a very long time that a computer would a computer would not be able to solve this game because it just takes way too much, way too long to calculate all these potential combinations. But finally, a team at Google uh, at uh, DeepMind managed to conquer this by applying new machine learning techniques to it. Now, naturally, this took a lot, a lot, a lot of compute. And that is what, for me, kind of was the surprising, that was kind of for me back in 2016, every, every time I hear about machine learning, the only thing I think about is clusters full of GPUs, crunching numbers. Um, and if that is kind of the state that you were in four year, or that's kind of the last that you heard about it, that's for me as well, and all of a sudden you log in today to the tiny ML Asia summit, you know, only four years after AlphaGo uh, beat Lisa Dong there, we fast forward here and all of a sudden we say no for machine learning, we don't need all of these clusters of uh, GPUs sitting in a data center. We can actually do this on tiny little devices. So shit, mind blown, actually, this is amazing. Like how can we go from all of these amazing large data centers full of GPUs to something that can run on really, really, really small devices. Um, typically what people say are like these devices that we actually are able to run machine learning on are just sensors. These are sensors that might run at, at one milliwatt power consumption. These might have 64 kilobytes of RAM, like a really, really, really big leap from what we had prior. So how do, how do we do that? And that's what I want to talk to you about in, in the next 25 minutes. Um, so I think the biggest, the biggest thing that we need to realize here is that a machine learning algorithm or a machine learning model is not something magical or something like a black box that you put random numbers in and then a, a magic prediction comes out. An ML model is still an algorithm. So I want to show you like, this by an example. So let's say that you're an embedded engineer and you're tasked with building an embedded system that can detect whether water is boiling. Um, pretty simple. Like I do it all the time. I, I made some tea and my, uh, uh, and my tea cooker actually needs to shut off the moment the water is boiling. So let's devise a very simple embedded device that can do that. Well, Let's take a temperature sensor and the 101 for um, building embedded systems. Um, and everyone knows that if the temperature of water is above 100 degrees, then that water starts boiling and below that it's not. So we write a very simple algorithm. If the temperature is above 100 degrees, then it's yes and otherwise it's no. And we can validate that quickly. So, you know, we heat up the water to 102 degrees. We put our temperature sensor in. And according to our algorithm, the water should be boiling and we observe that it's indeed boiling at that time. Um, and you know, we do that as well for 98 degrees. Uh, once again, you know, we put our temperature sensor in the water. Our little algorithm that we just devised says, no, the water is not boiling and we can actually observe that it's, that it's not the case either. Cool, we have a little device. But now we go mountain climbing. So we climb up to two kilometers high. I've been in Lijiang with all the dancing mountain people in China, absolutely amazing, a couple of years ago. So let's say that I go there and I, I take my cool, it's my water boiling device with me. I stick it in the water and it's 98 degrees. And according to my algorithm, this should not be boiling. But we actually observe that it is boiling 
yeah, mind blown again, um, because uh, weather, water, cooling does not just depend on the temperature, it also depends on the altitude that you are, or more specifically, the uh, atmospheric pressure. Now, the way that we can kind of, finding these hidden correlations might be a lot of work. Like right now, we can find the formula that says, well, if I have it's good normal water and I have the temperature data and I have the altitude or the, the barometric pressure, I can calculate whether that should be bo uh, calculate the boiling point. But what if you're not there? Machine learning can help you find that hidden correlation. So you start off by just collecting data. So as said, at 98 degrees, at an altitude of zero meters, the water is not boiling. At 102 degrees, at an altitude of zero meters, it is boiling. Then again, when we go mountain climbing, it is boiling at 98 degrees, but it's not at 91 degrees. Um, so that, that first step of collecting the data is always the very, is always the most important, I think, step in doing machine learning. It is also a very, very resource intensive step. Preferably, I just write a little short algorithm with a bunch of if clauses and be done with it. Because now, all of a sudden, to get accurate data here, I need to go mountain climbing, preferably to a bunch of different heights and, and different um, atmospheric pressures. So, but after I collected the data, um, I can now devise these both in kind of my data points and my label. So here, my data is temperature and altitude. Those are my two variables. And I try to um, determine a third unknown variable from that. I try to find a correlation. And that's what machine learning does. So here, yes and no is my label. And what I try to do during my, during my training phase of my machine learning model is that I want to find the function that most accurately maps the data to my label. Um, and it takes lots of trial and error. So an ML model, before it starts training, it's just it is randomly initialized and it just starts trying stuff out until it finally has a method that actually maps from these temperature, these temperature and altitude values to boiling, yes or no. It doesn't mean it's correct. It just finds the best approximation based on, the, based on your data, which means that the quality of your data and the amount of data is crucial. If your data quality is bad, you're never going to find a good model. Um, but at the end, after we take all this loss and trial and error and we have our model, we might find a formula like this. Um, temperature plus the altitude divided by 304. If that is above 100, then water is boiling. Otherwise, it's not. Now, the beautiful thing here is this training phase, like getting the data and trying to finicky and, and find this formula, very long process. Afterwards, this is just mathematics, just math. So the very first trick that we realized when we start, when we wanted to run machine learning models on these really, really constrained devices is say, okay, well, Let's stay away from actually collect, stay away from training that model, but rather just focus on inferencing. Somewhere in the cloud or somewhere on a big computer with a GPU cluster, that is where we find this formula. But after that, it's just mathematics. And microcontrollers, like the, the small devices um, that we like to run these algorithms on, are really, really good at math already. Um, a typical Cortex-M4 microcontroller might be able to do 40 million operations a second. Small operations, naturally, 40 million operations a second. So after you find a formula, and that formula doesn't have too many parameters, actually calculating that on device is relatively quick. Um, that also means that there's some stuff that you can't easily do, and it's kind of typically outside of the scope of TinyML when we talk about that. So. If we do training of these algorithms, so we have new data coming in and that might change this formula a little bit, that's typically outside of the scope what we can do on device. So rather you push that to the cloud, you retrain and then you push that model back to device. There's a couple of tricks that you can use here to do this more efficiently. Um, so TensorFlow Lite, for example, um, what lots of people use as a, yeah. If you use, for example, TensorFlow Lite and you, you serialize kind of the model into Flash, you can say, well, my model architecture, so the, the shape of my formula, I'd like to say it, like the number of parameters in my formula, I'm gonna say that those will always stay the same. And then I store the weights, so the yeah, kind of the values of all these parameters 
um, the going to my formula, I stored it in a separate part and I can update that part separately from the rest of my firmware. So that's, that's a nice way of, of dealing with that. So first rule one, stick with inferencing. That's it. That already saves us a lot of trouble and makes this stuff possible because just microcontrollers are good at math. Um, so what we see here, um, so let's say that we're looking for the correlation between an input signal, an audio input signal here with 16,000 data points, and the outcome should be someone said yes, someone said no, or someone said unknown. Um, so neither yes or yes nor no. Um, so machine learning can be found to find this hidden correlation. It is really, really, really hard. It's relatively easy to write something that can, that can pretend that the water is boiling with a temperature and altitude sensor because there's only two inputs. But if I'm looking at audio data, it's really, really hard to look at a waveform and then determine, did someone say yes? Did someone say no? Or, did, or was it any of the other billions of possible sounds? That were being made, that were that were being said here, or being made here, or was it just noise? So machine learning is really good at finding this hidden correlation, um, but it requires a really large model architecture with maybe hundreds of thousands of parameters. That's what we call a neural network architecture or machine learning architecture. Um, now, while you're training your model, so while you're trying to find this hidden correlation, you need really you need nice precision between all these little connected parameters. Um, and that's because we start out with kind of a random state of all these parameters. And then we do lots and lots of trial and error to try to find the right, to find the right parameter values. Um, so that you need to have a really high precision to make these really small adjustments. So, so as I said, we have this mathematical formula, really big, lots of parameters. And we need to go from a random state to slowly like tuning all these little parameters until we finally have something that, that finds this correlation. Um, so lots of high precision um, adjustment needed there. The nice thing is um, a couple of years ago, um, Song Hanadol realized that after your model is trained, you don't need the super high precision anymore. Um, so typically in a, in a neural network, um, this precision is, is noted in float 32, so four bytes per value, um, which takes, naturally takes lots of RAM. If I have 100,000 parameters and I need to hold all of them in, in RAM, that means I need 400K of RAM. Um, they realize that you can reduce this precision. Well, if you have a trained network, you can just reduce that to say one byte uh, and don't lose too much precision in your network. So that's really great. All of a sudden, I only need 100K of RAM instead of 400k. Um, so typically what we see here, 8-bit quantization is, is kind of what most people use at the moment. Um, that means that we have four times less RAM used, but also that we can use SIMD instructions um, to run this much faster. So modern processors and even a microcontroller like a Cortex-M4 or a Cortex-M7 um, coming from ARM have vector extensions in place. And that means that if you have small values like 8-bit integers, you can push multiple of them and do multiplications of them um, in, in kind of one operation, which is really cool. So you can run this much faster as well. So quantization, brilliant thing. Um, 8 bit quantization is used a lot, but there are people that are experimenting with, okay, can we fit this even in, in, um, in four bits? So four bit quantization, or do we need to dynamically change that? Another DSP group, I think they have a talk later. Um, they do this kind of stuff. So per layer, they determine what the quantization level should be. So quantization is not a kind of holy grail. Um, it, my thing is always like try to measure what the impact of quantization is in your network. So what we see at an impulse is that we see a typical speed up between 2x and 5x, which is great, but it might not always be necessary, right? If you um, it's always a trade-off. So yeah, maybe your model might be two times faster, but if you lose 5% precision, then that might not be worth it. Um, and the larger your model, the larger your error is as well. So we have seen on large image models, like an error rate of up to 15%. That is really big. Um, you see actually an example here on the left of an audio model. So this is a 2D convolutional neural network um, running on a Cortex-M4F um, at 80 megahertz. And so the unoptimized 
um, Flow32 model achieves an accuracy of 93.92% and the quantized one 93.08. So it drops by less than 1% point. Um, whether that's worth it, that's something for you to decide. So we, we always try to guide our users a little bit and say, okay, this is the actual impact that's going to have. Um, but we also see that we have about three times as little RAM required and that we're about five times as fast actually on the same hardware. So in this case, probably this is worth it. Um, but here's always, it's a trade-off. It's not magic, it's a trade-off. So measure the impact that you have. Um, so these hundreds of thousands of parameters, like during your training phase, that is really important because, well, you need to find the correlation and we don't know where that correlation is going to be. Um, but similar to quantization, we realized, or we realized that the accuracy might not, as, not be as important. Um, there are also parameters in this network or, that are not that important either, that contribute very little to the eventually end goal of the network. Um, so the third trick that we're, that we're seeing to be applied, uh, not, not as much as pruning as quantization yet, but it's, but it's coming definitely going into uh, this year and noted a bunch of um, people are doing, doing very advanced research on this, is pruning. So lots of parameters, certain parameters barely influence the outcome, especially after quantization. So if you quantize from four bytes to one byte, that means you only have 255 potential values. And there's lots of values that are kind of zero um, after that. So they contributed a little bit to the outcome before quantization, but after um, it's about well, less. So with pruning, we can say, well, we find all the parameters that don't contribute much here and remove them. Something that I'm super excited about actually, and that's some research that came out of Facebook, is that um, what Facebook has observed is that in large networks, so really, uh, so let's say, if, if, I don't know, billions of parameters, that there might be a sub-network, so a small network of maybe a million parameters sitting somewhere in that really large network that performs very similarly. And I think that will be interesting to, uh, to see with TinyML because we are looking for much smaller networks. So it'd be interesting to see what the state of the art is on really large, uh, really large models and then see if we can find, I think the, the paper is called the lottery ticket. If there's a lottery ticket hidden somewhere in that we can then use uh, on smaller devices. So that was number three, pruning. All right, so, um, so we know that we can run, this device, run these models on device because it's just inferencing. We can make them run a lot uh, in a lot less RAM because we use quantization and a little bit faster as well. Um, we can throw away part of the network to make them even smaller with pruning. But I think that the best tip here is actually try to lend your ML algorithm a hand. So this is an example of real, uh, of real data from an accelerometer that one of our customers collected. Um, and this is a waveform. And this is incredibly messy. And what I said at the beginning of my talk, like data is the most important asset that you have. It takes a lot of effort actually collecting the data and labeling it in a good way. And so lending your ML algorithm a hand already the moment that you collect that data and makes their life, make its life a lot easier. Um, that, is, that is probably the best thing you can do. So, and the nice thing is, there are often ready-made solutions, especially when you're dealing with sensor data that we understand very well and don't require any, any machine learning here. So here I have a waveform from an accelerometer. I can apply a low pass filter. This is incredibly well known technology and there's hardware, hardware accelerations in this for, for on most chips, um, apply a low pass filter and then I get a clean waveform out. And it's gonna be much easier for me to find the frequencies um, or spectral density components from this signal um, after this. And it's also gonna make my ML model, it's gonna make the life of my ML model a lot easier because all the noise is already removed and we don't need to encode that in the network. And we can also use this to make our network smaller so here is a raw audio waveform, and that waveform is for one second of data, uh, 16,000 features. So 16,000 data points. And that means that the input layer of my neural network, for example, needs to have 16,000 neurons. So, but 
you know, there's lots of information that a ML model, typically neural networks, um, have lots of trouble learning. They need really large networks for. And one of those is a time frequency domain analysis. Um, so what we could do is say, well, we understand how to do that, FFTs. We can go from this raw waveform to a time frequency domain already ourselves, which is you know, well understood primitives, signal processing, um, and outputs a spectrogram. So what we've done here is one, this kind of nonlinear function of uh, mapping raw audio data to time frequency domain, we've already done that. So that's something that the neural network or your machine learning model doesn't have to learn anymore. So it's gonna make it slightly easier. And we reduced in this case, our feature sets from 16,000 to just over 3000 features. So our model can be smaller as well. Um, and people are you know, constantly iterating over this and we can, even, we can go even further by choosing something that's very optimized for a specific use case. So for speech, for example, Mel frequency sexual coefficients are the, are the thing that everyone is using. Um, Google is using it in their micro speech examples. Um, Edge Impulse is using it in anything that has speech related code. And Mel frequency sexual coefficients are a mapping to time frequency domain, but really optimized just for speech and finding like the distinct components in speech. And finding and using something like that uh, allows you to go even smaller. So from the 16,000 data points that we had to the 3,000 data points in a spectrogram, we can go down to, in our typically models that we have, go down to about 600 parameters. So that's a compression of the original signal of 30 times already before we even do any ML. Plus we clean the data up and we highlight the interesting things. So that, may, that means that we can do much, much, much smaller um, machine learning models at the end. So always, if you're thinking about applying machine learning with sensor data, realize that on-device intelligence is not new. We've been doing on-device intelligence for a very long time. So leverage signal processing here. Um, look at what we've been doing in the past, cumulative knowledge you know, of everyone in the industry. Apply that, reduce your input features leading to a much smaller network and it cleans up your input. Um, and it also gives you some insight, early insights in data set quality. So this is Google keyword uh, spotting model. Um, in this case, highlighting yes and no. The only thing we've done here is we um, run MFCC over every data set, data, uh, data sample. So we go from the waveform to the male frequency central coefficients kind of spectrogram. And then we use UMAP, uh, a dimensionality reduction algorithm um, to uh, map that to three dimensions. And you see here that the data already separates. So you see in blue, no, and in green, yes. And this is without doing any machine learning yet. Feeding this data into a machine learning model is gonna make life really easy. I can, I can draw a line through this myself. So that's great. Um, cool. So going to number five, so constraints matter and think about those constraints when you're designing your model. So we have a, let's say here a device and that device is a microcontroller. And um, my controller has a bunch of constraints already. So the available RAM and the available flash that you might have, um, the sensor suite that is available. Sensors differ a lot. If you, accelerometers come in kind of cheap form and they come in really expensive form. And depending on the quality of your acceler accelerometer, you're gonna be able to sense certain things and, and not gonna sense other things. Um, you have a power budget that you need to work with. Um, you might have a requirement for the number of inferences per second that you run. Um, and you might have a chip that has hardware acceleration for certain, uh, for certain operations and that you probably want to use where possible. And I like to think, when you think about building a new product with TinyML, look at those constraints from the very, very, very start. Because these are actually going to determine whether you have, whether you're going to be able to deploy a model successfully in the wild, yes or no. Um, especially if you can retrofit this on something existing. So for new hardware, you're typically looking at a two year cycle before it's, uh, before it's on the market. Um, and the bill of materials matters here as well. So if you say, okay, well, we have 
we can do everything that we want here and we can definitely um, uh, showcase and, and detect the things that we're interested in, but we need a much more expensive chip and our bill of materials goes up. At some point, your CEO or the COO will say to you, okay, well, this doesn't fly. We need to keep our bomb low. So realize what you're designing for at the very beginning of your project and keep those constraints in mind while you're building. Don't try and go off and find the absolute best model for the things you're building, but find the best model with the latency memory and accuracy constraints that you have. And also realize that signal processing can help you, but those are also hyperparameters. If you have an accelerometer, do we need an FFT length of 1024 or 512? Maybe my model works a bit better with, yeah, it's a hyperparameter. Maybe I can have a smaller model if I pick a higher value, but what effect is it going to have on my latency memory and accuracy constraints? Um, so with Edge Impulse, we try to visualize that a little bit. So on one end, we have uh, our own neural network compiler, which has like TensorFlow Lite kernels underneath that makes this a bit smaller, but it also allows us to do really accurate memory calculations um, straight in, uh, in our product. So this is, for example, how we visualize this. So if you have a male frequency central coefficient, stopping for audio with an FT length of 128, that's going to take 212 milliseconds. With an FFT length of 256, it's going to take 306. So do you want the actual accuracy, yes or no? And then we show the same for neural networks. So a 1D convolutional neural network might take four milliseconds, a 2D convolutional neural network might take 36. So it's a trade-off between latency, RAM, and accuracy here. Um, something else that we can that we can leverage here is uh, it's pretty new. I don't know of a lot of products using it in the wild, but I do think it's going to be really important going into 2021. Um, I realize that when you're looking at real-time sensor data, very often nothing changes. So here is let's say a stationary camera with a uh, someone on a bike. And when we're kind of classifying this, the only thing we're interested in is the person on the bike there. And we can kind of ignore everything else. But that is not how most of these neural networks work today or machine learning algorithms work today. They classify everything that they see, which is kind of wasteful. Um, so a really, really exciting um, technique here is sparsity. So if we can realize that changes are often localized, um, this is, this is relatively easy with images because, well, we can visualize that nice and quickly in two D in two dimensions. Um, if only that part of the image changes, can we only run inference, run our machine learning model over that part and keep everything else uh, same? And that means we only need to recalculate um, the groups of neurons that are affected there. I think it's super interesting. Um, because if we can get this to work nicely, it means that all of a sudden on devices that can currently do image classification, and these are many, many microcontrollers, Cortex, Cortex M7 microcontroller, for example. I know that HiMax is doing a talk um, somewhere, somewhere in the next couple of days. They have their WE1 chip. It's not an ARM one, but it has, uh, has a DSP on it. That's already fast enough to do image classification. If you can exploit sparsity, and thus for video images, only need to do stuff with changes. All of a sudden we can do video inferencing on microcontrollers, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So number six, exploit parts to here. Um, and then for number seven, really, there's still a lot to be found, right? Lots of research around machine learning has gone into really, really large ML models. Um, and these state-of-the-art models don't translate well to small devices because we need to think about, okay, can we do quantization? Can we do pruning? How do these things work together with signal processing pipelines? If you have unlimited compute, it's really easy to say, okay, well, I'm just gonna make my neural network as big as possible and something will come out. Um, whereas if we need to run this on constraint devices, just think about what works already when you're thinking about on-device machine or on-device intelligence in the past. So, don't take the state of the art for granted. You know, explore here, think a bit outside the box. Um, for us, kind of at Edge Impulse, the, the most interesting realization that we had was that our best anomaly detection algorithm, our best anomaly detection model is not a neural network. 
if we have a, a machine, you want to know if it vibrates a little bit differently than other machines. A neural network is not even the best choice for us. It's just very basic k-means clustering. So we could have gone into researching the best neural network architectures and, and finding a state-of-the-art papers on that. But instead, we figured, okay, what can we do to, to deploy this the quickest um, and accurate enough? And we actually realized that a very basic k-means clustering model worked really well for us. Um, and also realized that the world was moving really fast. Um, so when I started at Gimpulse in June 2019, the very first model that we built was a vibration monitoring system running on a Cortex M4F. And, and I saw the video uh, recently, the, the first video we shot of our model, and it, start, and it ran at 472 milliseconds per inference. And we thought that was cool. It's real time, right? It, it analyzed two seconds of data. So we, you know, we spent a quarter of our time actually processing it, but it was be fine. Now, with the work that Google has been doing on this for light, the work that the community has been doing on quantization, the work that we've been doing in Sigma processing, the work that ARM has been doing on CMSS and M, we now run the same model in 16 milliseconds, 200, 200x improvement, or 20x. Um, similarly with RAM, um, a 96 by 96 vision model, um, back in August 2020, one of the models that we produced took 440 kilobytes of RAM, and then with a bunch of optimizations that we did, um, now this actually runs in 297k of RAM. So for me, kind of, if I click my stages of tiny ML, and I, I hope you saw that as well when I was talking about uh, sparsity, which I think is super interesting because it, I think it's going to allow us to push video to microcontrollers. Um, it's kind of this. So summer of 2017, before I got involved, like. I really thought that ML, on, the, ML on, on embedded systems was completely impossible. Then in summer 2018, I was leading a team at ARM that was looking at, uh, at ML on the edge. I figured, okay, yeah, it is possible, but probably only for really basic and really small models. Um, in summer 2019, we thought, okay, shit, well, we can probably do real-time audio on microcontrollers, but that is probably it. Um, and summer 2020, we, we released our image pipeline and we thought, okay, holy shit, we can actually do real-time image classification. So this is only in four years time. And that is for me, someone in sitting in the space. Um, and I can only think of the summer of 2021 and I have no idea what to expect, but I, I definitely know that it's going to be amazing. And we're going to be able to push much, much, much more ML models to these types of devices. So super, super exciting field. And also really, really excited to see what kind of the, the community in Asia will, will push through. So if you're enthusiastic after this day, you want to get started. Um, so the Tiny ML book was highlighted a couple of times already. So that book is written by Pete Warden and um, Dan Sitniake. Um, Dan used to work with Pete at Google. He's currently our lead ML engineer at Edge Impulse. Um, so definitely get a book. It's not translated in Chinese as well. Um, or that's great. I think it's definitely the easiest way to get started um, is grab some hardware because this stuff is really fun only if you're playing with hardware. For me, getting an ML model to run on hardware for the first time was, was mind blowing. It was kind of like I was 10 years old again, having Visual Basic 6 in front of me and typing my name and the computer said, hello, young. Mind blowing. Um, so grab some hardware. There's a bunch of places here on the right, but you can find that on docs.dimples.com. Um, or get any of your data in with the data forwarder tool that we have. Um, input that in the Edge Impulse. We have fantastic tutorials on building vibration models, building audio models, and doing image classification on real microcontrollers. But you can even use your phone. So grab that. So docs at Impulse.com. Um, here's uh, Dan, the author of the Tiny ML book, co-author of the Tiny ML book, doing an end-to-end -end tutorial on, um, on audio here. So follow one of these. These are end-to-end -end tutorials with nice little videos. So if you want to do anything, whether it's recognizing if, you're, if your cat is trying to steal some food, if you want to build a self-driving car or something that, rec that responds to your voice, um, all of that possible these days on microcontrollers. So go check that out. And if you've never built a model, just do that. I think it shows really the power of ML for sensor data. Um, so to recap, I think, first of all, machine learning and sensors are an absolute perfect fit. Um, if you're not convinced, definitely in the next two talks, uh, for example, in the talk by uh, Evgeny about um, the applications for TinyML, you'll, you'll definitely see that. Um, 
we are still pushing boundaries here. The work that you're seeing today and, and the rest of the week is just a snapshot of what we've been doing as an industry. Um, but we're pushing boundaries every day, every week, every month. So if you think that there's a use case that's currently not possible, go come check back in two months. It might very well be of change. Um, and I also, the most important thing here, um, and, and my, last, my last point here is machine learning is great, but it's just an engineering tool. It's not a magic black box. And try and combine, try apply a little bit of machine learning as an engineering tool together with your experience. And I think that is an absolute unique opportunity. So if you build something really cool, go to forums.tinyml.org and uh, share your work. We'll also be there to answer any questions that come up during the day. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, give it back to Rudan. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. A question from Jack Chan. And uh, what is the memory of MIPS needed to run audio or image recognition on the ARM Cortex M4 class device? That's a good question. Um, so what we see for audio classification, so kind of, it depends a bit what you want to do. Do you want to do anything with human voice or um, uh, monitoring machines or whatever? But um, typically what we see is we'll need about um, 20 kilobytes of RAM, and that allows you to run a, either calculate a, an MFC spectrogram for human, human speech or a normal spectrogram um, for kind of everything else. Um, and then you can run kind of 1D or 2D convolution on or kind of about 10K of RAM these days. It's, it's really nice and really small and the nice thing you can page in and page out. So if you don't need to statically allocate everything, you can do this in 20K of RAM. And on an M4F, uh, running at 80 megahertz, you can probably do this about 200 milliseconds per inference. Um, but the nice thing here is because we have spectrograms that we that we create um, and spectrograms with time dimension, you can constantly create slices of data, slices of these spectrograms, and then concat them back and then do classification over that. And that allows uh, and that allows you to do six, seven, eight inferences a second on kind of this stitched together buffer all the time. Um, so we have some examples actually at the uh, at Impulse Docs on doing this. So the only thing you need to do is hook up your DMA buffer into our continuous audio pipeline, and then we we run that six, seven, eight times a second. For for image models, it depends a little bit what you want. I think in uh, Matt's presentation, we're going to show he's going to show some stuff around um, how optimizing for how monochrome images, for example, can can do lots that color images can do as well. Um, the kind of the smallest that we can go um, is about 100K of RAM, but that goes up to 400K of RAM for, for really large models. So it's, it depends a little bit on what you, on what you need. Um, but the good thing is on the higher end Cortex-M7s and on some of the higher end non-ARM DSPs, we can do, we just did it with a, with a customer, we can do seven frames a second um, inferencing on a 96 by 96 three color image on a, a mobile net inspired uh, model with four classes. So that's actually, that's almost in the, in the realms of, of video already on a microcontroller, which I think is mind blowing. Okay, thank you Jan for the answer. And thank you Jack for the question. And we got another question. That's quite an open question is about uh, what, what do you think is the biggest problem in tiny machine learning, like speed, size of the network or accuracy? Um, why do you think uh, that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Neither actually. I think, off, huh? yeah. I think I think the biggest the biggest problem is data. Um, data. so collecting data, the, I think why a lot of initial developments in machine learning were made um, by kind of the large cloud companies and, and stuff is because all the data is already digital. And if we want to apply um, machine learning to sensor data, which is kind of which is what we do often with TinyML. The data needs to come from the real world and someone needs to go out and actually collect that. It's not already sitting in the database. Um, so what we see that the companies that take this very, very seriously, um, have started doing the data collection phase already quite early, but it's expensive, right? If you're building a health wearable and you want to know if um, you want to know the sleep patterns or something or, or sleep phase of someone, well, 
to get the data, you can't just log into your to your database and, and query that. No, you need to do a clinical study and have people actually sleep with like uh, ECG pads on and then cross-reference that with your data. That's collecting that data is expensive. So um, yeah, we try to we try to help with that. With and I noted a bunch of other companies in in the uh, in the tiny all community do that as well. And how can we make that easier? How can we do the data collection phase and the labeling phase a bit easier? I think that's that's currently the biggest problem. Um, Okay, thank you. Yeah, very, very um, opinion based. Because time is <laughs> limited, let me have the last question. Very quick, very quick question. Okay, uh, can you please enable H plus for ARM devices like STM32? Is H, it that H plus? Possible? Do you repeat the question? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Enable H plus H in plus. That's your your company uh, the technology uh, yeah. for the ARM devices like STM32. Yeah. So actually, so you don't even need to wait for me to do that. So if you want to get data into Edge Impulse, um, go to the data forwarder. Mm -hmm. You can just write some code over UART. It dump you dump it over UART. We pick it up and we store it. And what we output is uh, royalty free open source C++ code that runs on any ARM board. Um, and we automatically load, and I think Matt is gonna talk much more deeply on that. We automatically load the vector extension codes, James and M, in to make this run really, really fast. So um, no need, just go to, the, go to the getting started page on the, on the docs and uh, that will guide you. And otherwise just shoot me an email or drop a question in the forums and I'd be happy to assist. So, so. Okay, good. I, I also see Jan has shared a link from the, for some resources from yep. aging paths, right? In the previous, yep. previous slide. And so we will also, can we post the link in the WeChat group and the chat team, then everyone can visit the resources. All right, thank you, Rudan. And so, thanks everyone so much. Okay. Jan, uh, Jan, I have one okay. question, if you don't mind, and okay, Rudan, if, if I may interrupt you, Genny here. So I have a question which may be important for this community moving forward. Um, and you made this point in your presentation. So it is a general belief that neural nets can solve all kinds of problems. And yet, Jan, you made a very important subtle point that it's not always the case. Uh, in many cases, it's uh, the old fashioned uh, either the K-ready clustering or random forest or other type of classifiers. So how do we kind of, uh, because uh, tiny email is going to be about solving problems in the future, yeah. right? How do we, how, how do people understand uh, what, what networks, what approaches, what algorithms to use um, that will be best for their problem? Uh, it's a hard question. So my, my, personal, my personal opinion here, but I, I don't come from an ML background. I come from an embedded engineering background. Um, and I just roll into this because I, I wanted to do this device, on device intelligence is we, we do signal processing first. So the very first thing is if you have some sensor data in a gimples, it's not what ML algorithm do you want to use? It is what signal processing algorithm do you think is going to help here? Um, and so we try to visualize that as well. And, and like, I think the UMAP view, uh, if, if people remember the yes, no data set, if that separates nicely, then we've done a good job already. So for us, that is always the very first step. First, make your data as clean as possible with some, with some signal processing. And, if your data after that is clean enough, you can already distinguish kind of what you want to detect and you don't need any ML, please go with that, right? You're gonna make your life a lot easier if you don't have kind of a, a trained model sitting in there. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, there's not, there's not a single answer, right? People come to TinyML because they, very often people come to TinyML because they've tried other approaches and they can't get to kind of the last, to make this accurate enough. Um, so that's why we need some ML. I think for us, I think for everyone is visualize stuff early, um, treat your signal processing parameters as hyperparameters to your network. Don't jump to machine learning too quickly, but rather think of this thing as a signal processing plus an ML pipeline as one kind of unit of work. Um, and I hope that we're going to see nice tools from the rest of the community around that um, coming into the future. So we would like to thank our sponsors who made this event possible. Our premier sponsor, um, the Software and Hardware Foundation for TinyML.
edge cortex with dynamic neural accelerator architecture and co-exploration engine brings cloud level performance to the edge. SynSense, SynSense builds ultra low power sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. Thank you for all our sponsors. Thank you for making this event possible. And thanks also go to our conference partner, Shanghai AI, a media partner, Zhidongxi AI in Manufacturing, EET, Zixi Zixin, Xin Shiye, and Zixie Gongye Chuban Shi. Thank you for our partners. You will find them all listed on the TinyML website at tinyml.org. So thank you for joining us today. And thank you for Jan and thank you for Matt and for Afghani for their wonderful presentations. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow.